Hey folks, it's Mark in quarantine, joined by Chris in quarantine. I'm in quarantine by proxy. I'm not actually sick, but my flatmate is sick. Yeah, I possibly have COVID. Um, my friend has it, and I was out with him on Friday night. So, and I don't feel too clever today. So, and you famously winch everyone goodbye. I mean, that is my thing. That's I'm known female for. Female and otherwise, yeah, absolutely. Mm. All comers, really. It's just like cheerio. Yeah. In the if I like you, then they're getting a, a, a smooch. Is it? That's what where, it works. Where were you born? Hallorgan. Right, see, I hear that's really that's a thing there. Is it? It's well, they knocked out the maternity hospital I was born in, so maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Mark, um, important things that are happening in the world. Uh, Dillinger Escape Plan decided they were going to get back together again and play Calculating Infinity, despite uh, is it Ben Wyman having a tattoo that <laughs> he swore he'd never do that. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> uh, You've seen the evidence, haven't you? I've seen the evidence. You showed me it, and I was quite. I was like, oh, okay. I guess that's definitive. Uh, I was interviewing him at the time in the QMU on the last ever tour. QMU is a venue in Glasgow for those that don't know, and uh, it was backstage where the whole band were there. And Greg is a live wire. I tell you that man, the guy's full of beans. But it's um, really interesting because the look in his face was like he meant it. It was like um, he could totally tell that he was like 100 percent genuine. Like this isn't when we're, once we're done, we're done. We're like we're not doing this ever again. So it's uh, Dimitri Minakakis that's coming in, isn't it? First time ever they played Calculating Infinity live. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Wow, well, man, it'd be nice to fly over to New York. It would be. So if you're listening to this podcast and you want to send, <laughs> I think three boys, I think Dave will probably uh, suddenly reappear at the door. <laughs> <laughs> probably, I would. <laughs> We'll, we'll go over to New York and we'll do some kind of special somehow if you pay for our flights. It we'll can get only to be meet about... to on the show. We'll get them to host the show. Yeah, we'll get them to, um, yeah, we'll just fuck off. <laughs> the yeah, uh, it'll only cost a couple of grand, so dig deep, listeners. Dig deep. When is it happening? Uh, next year, sometime. Yeah, let's find the exact date so we can give people a countdown. <laughs> 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 it's going to be a lonely fucking countdown that one. <laughs> You know those people that set up Kickstarters Like I need to raise £10,000 To convert my garage In mm. a studio And they <laughs> got like 48 quid Two days out <laughs> You can't bear to look <laughs> It's the 21st of June in, in, in New York So yeah Right that's your objective audience it's Six the- months Get us to that show, otherwise you're dumped. <laughs> Mar- Mark will winch you goodbye, but you're still dumped. Uh, yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, other things that are happening in the world is that we're about, hopefully, about to record the Christmas special. The whole COVID trepidation <laughs> thing is because, you know, it's hard to align our schedules, and if we don't do it on this set date, it could be quite tricky. So if we do get COVID, I hope it's very quick. And yeah. it's out the road And if we don't Then I hope we just don't <laughs> um, So <laughs> Fingers crossed We stick to that uh, We got a total glut of questions In the last 48 hours By the way mm. uh, That's swollen So we may have a rapid fire episode <laughs> <laughs> Yeah <laughs> Uh, if you're in a, if you're in the unsung Facebook group, I mean, you can submit a question, but at this point, it may not get answered. <laughs> Who's to uh, say? Uh, we've never done a rapid fire round on a Christmas special. That might be quite funny. Yeah, like you have true. a you have a little timer, like a little chess timer. <laughs> You've got <laughs> a buzz- seconds go. <laughs> a buzzer, a like countdown. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of the questions are really really good. I was actually laughing out loud reading some of them last night. Uh, it's plenty of cheeky questions, and actually, I really like it when people ask cheeky questions. They've got a good nose for mystery. But we are about to embark on a very special mixtape that we've kind of been toying with for a while uh, I think, I'll be honest, I think it's gone from one episode to two episodes Because certainly my, my notes look that way <laughs> um, But I'm pretty comfortable that it's going to be interesting throughout Because goddamn, karaoke is an interesting and fun subject to research It turns out that is the case I think I <laughs> messaged you about this a while ago uh, suggesting that And I actually don't like karaoke that much <laughs> But I've actually grown to like it more since researching it, which is fucking wild. Since my birthday, that's what you meant to say. Uh, oh, sorry, since your birthday, yeah. <laughs> I do apologize. Because my birthday was a karaoke party. It's too uh, many winching, I can't I can remember. <laughs> everybody, everybody leaving and coming back just to get a free winch. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was a really fun birthday party. And a lot of people that I didn't bank on singing much sang more, i.e. you. I had, to, I had to save somebody <laughs> so. <laughs> He sang quite a bit I had to save people man That's just You know what it's yeah, like as a singer right You have sometimes you need to step yeah, in and go just, oh, Fucking hell Ultimately you're selfless Really that's what it is Yeah Big heart uh, But you were you were good You were good You were more enthusiastic than I expected And you 
it wasn't necessarily the material I expected either. <laughs> um, do you remember much of what you sang that night? I remember seeing a motorcycle emptiness, which as you, yeah, you, would imagine, you would imagine is a stick on for me, but I just n- never ever crossed my mind to ever do that song in karaoke, ever. Did you, do you do it with somebody on that? No, it was under pressure I did, but the guy who I did it with didn't actually know, <laughs> didn't actually know Freddie's parts. <laughs> so I was like, I'll be David Bowie, if, if someone is Freddie, I'll definitely do it under pressure. And the guy was like, I'll fucking do it. And then he thought it was Bohemian Rhapsody, and I was like, no, mate, <laughs> it is not. Uh, um, well, that's, so. ultimately though, that's what karaoke is about, yeah. right? We just cut to the chase. It's about enthusiasm and just gone with it, as we would say. Just get into the spirit and trying to not be too uptight and not be too self-conscious. Um, I think our takes on it will be fleshed out, uh, but we've also got the contribution of a number of guests from this year, including obviously Vicky, but we've got a note from Siobhan Wilson, we've got a note from Grant Donaldson, last week's guest on the episode about 68. Uh, we've got a note from Rebecca Yurevna, who was with us for Short Paris, uh, Rebecca based in New York City, family from Russia, mm-hmm. uh, and also a, a karaoke connoisseur, as I've, I've found out firsthand. And uh, we've got a message from Xu Yin in China, mm. uh, who was our guest on that episode as well. So a diverse array of perspectives on karaoke. And we'll drop them in as we're going through. But, I mean, before we get into like, I like this, I don't like that, blah, blah, blah. We, we should do a bit of a our trademark due diligence uh, mm-hmm. a little bit of documentarian work here and dig into what is karaoke where did it come from uh, what does it mean mm. Mark yes tell us dispel any ambiguity what does karaoke mean it basically translates to empty orchestra which is really apt <laughs> when you think about yes, it <laughs> the empty orchestra that's um, it's a clipped compound which I think is that just the same as a portmanteau uh, yeah I think ja- the ja- Japanese do that quite a lot um, yes, so it's part of the word for empty and part of the word for orchestra yeah. kind of like smashed into each other Like Lego, the Danish Legot, play well, play good Oh really? Yeah, so it's a portmanteau of Lego, Lego. Mm-hmm. There you go So also, something I found out, that uh, Scotland is pretty high up the list of countries that are into karaoke we're, Outside we're of Asia, yeah <laughs> Outside of Asia, yes, outside of Asia, granted. But yeah, we're apparently pretty enthusiastic about it, notably so. Um, I know, and I can't just you walk about the city centre on a Saturday night to know how enthusiastic <laughs> we are about it. Yeah, it is something as well that's blossomed a bit in the, the last decade. I remember way back doing the odd karaoke thing, and it's usually the private room thing, which we'll talk about later on. And there were limited options, and now there's there's quite a lot. And then you've obviously, obviously got the classic sort of like working man's pub, Friday and Saturday, karaoke with Jill or karaoke with Andy, mm-hmm. uh, and just somebody belting things out to a pub, and the pub have no choice but to listen and or get involved and or fuck off home. So there's different approaches here, and people have different preferences, as we'll find out from the voice notes as well. See, on that latter point, I know... Used to know Ken. I don't really talk to her that much anymore. I guess someone who used to do that that very thing in Prestwick. She was a host, and she would uh, go to the pub. I think it was a Friday and a Saturday, and she would be the karaoke host. And yeah, she would get paid not 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 uh, not an unsubstantial amount for doing it as well. And she could sing. To, she could sing to be fair. I'm sure a lot of our regulars probably couldn't, but she could sing. Um, but I uh, that is a dying art, I think, um, because people you can just do it in pubs now, can't you? Don't really need a, yeah. a host anymore. Well, get us off to a colourful start here as well with an anecdote that I've said in the show before. So, regulars, I apologise. It's probably about the third time I've told this, but uh, some friends of mine in a town nearby Glasgow, we play football there, and we were trying to get a football match done in time to get home and watch the big football match, the cup game featuring Celtic that night which was taking place in that town. And so we get through to that town and two of the guys really needed a pee. And so they ran into the nearby pub, one of those Scottish pubs with just like tiny little square windows so you can't break them in a flat roof. Mm -hmm. They ran into this pub and the pub was absolutely mobbed with Celtic and Airdrie fans who were getting ready for the game. It was absolutely bouncing. You had to fight your way through it. And there was a karaoke going on. It's only about midday or something. And uh, they get towards the back of the room and as the crowd parts and they get near the toilet, the karaoke setup's there and it is none other than Rod Stewart Mm -hmm. with a guy under each arm singing along to Rod Stewart songs on karaoke (laughs) (laughs) at midday in Airdrie before a Celtic match. And as anybody who's ever been on YouTube basically in Scotland knows, uh, Rod Stewart later that afternoon drew the balls for the next round of the, the cup 
and was absolutely shit faced on he that program. Yeah. Google that if you don't know. I mean, most people call him well not, but if you have never seen it, it is truly, truly a sight. So yeah, that's uh, that's my opening gambit of uh, karaoke anecdotes. Uh, we've got another one later on actually that I'll, uh, I got today in all places of the printing shop, courtesy mm-hmm. of Neil. The printing guy. The so, printing uh, guy. Hey, hey, Neil, printing guy. Thanks for that. Yeah, he's printed a lot of notes over the years for me. Um, okay, the origins of karaoke. Uh, <laughs> sing along with Mitch. Does that mean anything to you? No. I hope that gal turns up. We have a marvelous hour ahead for her and you. A great minstrel show, complete right down to the tambourine. Then some numbers inspired by mandolins, fiddles, and saxophones. Some railroad songs as exciting as the ride with the engineer. And finally, a rousing salute to Gilbert Sullivan. So let's warm up, shall we? I never do that So, uh, from 1961 to 1966, the, the NBC channel carried a karaoke-like series called Sing Along With Mitch, featuring the host Mitch Miller uh, and, and a chorus and a kind of singing troupe, which superimposed the lyrics to the songs near the bottom of the TV screen for people at home to just sing along. The bouncing the, ball. It had the, the lyrics along the bottom of the, of the thing, and they would perform some music in the background, and the whole thing was that everybody in the house was meant to sing along, which seems absolutely fucking mental now. No, <laughs> I cannot imagine. A household doing that, but uh, I was well, in 68. there are versions of some Disney films that are on Disney on Disney Plus, which have the exact same thing, the sing along. I think that's actually been done in a few cinemas over the past couple of years from Disney films specifically. Wow, I mean yeah. that actually, you know, you said it makes total sense, yeah, especially yeah. if it's a, a, a children's audience. Yeah, I guess oh, totally. it depends when this was on. So anyway, around that time, you know, technological changes in the sixties and seventies in terms of re- recorded music and your ability to store it and, and transport it. You know, the the, the portability of it. That, that opened up a lot of doors for singers who could then perform on the road with a full arrangement. You know, rather than standing with an acoustic guitar or travelling with a full band, they could go out and just sort of do their thing and it, it lent itself particularly well to certain styles of music. Mm. Um, cassette tapes are given particular credit for accelerating this process as well because I think 8-track, we'll talk about that in a second, was really popular. Um, obviously vinyl was not practical really for it, but cassette tapes, the smaller ones, just were so convenient and pocket-sized and it you could get a lot of data on them as well so as we said uh, karaoke is a phrase that that already existed in Japan at the time and it was for performers on TV shows who could not bring their backing band so they used recordings instead and these recordings were karaoke the phrase was first used in the context that we're using it um, by uh, Shig we're going to have a few Japanese names here so I I apologise in advance Shigichi Negishi or Negishi uh, when he was asking a friend at a Japanese TV station to try and find them some backing music versions of pop tunes that they used on the channel. So he's got this mate and he's like, can you hook me up with some instrumental versions of songs? And the friend replied to him, oh, you want karaoke tapes? And he was like, what's that? Well, that's what it was. Uh, now, these tapes were actually to be used on Negishi's new invention. So he was a Japanese engineer who ran a consumer electronics business and he made the first prototype of a dedicated karaoke machine in 1967. He soon began marketing a kind of coin-operated version and he named it the Sparkle Box, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a fucking, one of those brilliant Japanese English names, if you know what I mean. They just, they translate so fucking well. Um, And that relied on 8-track tapes for audio and the lyrics were provided in a little booklet. By the way, that guy is now, as best I can tell, I think he's 97 or 98 years old. He was he was interviewed when he was 95 and he was still going strong and the machine was still going strong that he originally <laughs> built. That's which cool. is astonishing. They don't make them like that anymore. Um, as a result of that, uh, and again, I'm sorry I'm going to butcher this, but mu- Mujo no Yume, uh, it translates as The Heartless Dream, was the first karaoke song ever sung. But Shigechi had distribution issues and eventually stopped making the Sparkle Box. Another early pioneer of it was a guy called Toshiharu Yamashita, who worked as a singing coach and in 1970, I think it was, 1970, yeah, sold an 8-track playback deck with a microphone for sing-alongs. Now, 
there's a name coming up that a lot of people traditionally associate with karaoke. Well, I'm just, I just wanted to give those two other guys some credit because they were technically before it, but they've never been quite as strongly associated uh, with the origins of it as, as this next guy. But I mean, music had long been a part of Japanese nightlife, and particularly in the post-war era, uh, there were a variety of establishments like cabarets, and I think they called them hostess clubs, that emerged to serve the needs of what were called salarymen, you know, working guys. Um, it's still a thing. It's still obviously, obviously still a yeah. thing, but yeah, the salary men would go out, still go out and get pissed into karaoke after work yeah. most nights of the week, you know? Yeah, it's, it's not even yuppies, is it, salary men? It's just sort of like working guys, office guys. In guys. Office, mm-hmm. Yeah, Yeah, because, I mean, in Japan, it's very much you get a certain job and that is your job, that's your life, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, so that would be for unwinding and entertaining clients and things like that, for business things, we'd take them to these. So in 1971, a nightclub musician called Daisuke Inoue independently invented his own karaoke machine in the city of Kobe. Now, as I say, this is the guy that is most commonly cited as the dude behind karaoke. Um, his biggest contribution was apparently understanding that amateurs had a lot of difficulty singing pop songs, and so he recorded his own versions in keys that would make them easier for your everyday day people to sing he also apparently in his machine included a a really early reverb function to basically Mm. help mask the deficiencies of the singers Um, for those reasons he's considered by many most maybe even to be the inventor in the modern business model for karaoke even though he actually was not the first to create a machine and did not like Nagishi or Yamashita file a patent and that's a really key thing didn't profit from it directly at all Exactly So uh, Inoue didn't f- uh, And I'm saying Inoue I hope that's how you pronounce it uh, Didn't patent the invention um, A Filipino man uh, Roberto De Rosario Filed a patent For a karaoke machine uh, Called the Sing Along System In 1975 And So it's Just to Put this in context Right A uh, perspective even uh, In 2019 alone, this is the figure that I got, it was for that year, it's estimated that Daisuke Inoue lost out on $100 million in royalties that one year by not having filed that patent. The funny thing is, when you see him interviewed about it, he seems like kind of a class act, he seems pretty proud of his legacy regardless and just kind of laughs and, yeah well, you know, fuck it. Um, in 2004 he was actually awarded the Ig Nobel, Nobel Prize. Prize yeah which is yeah. a funny thing you know <laughs> <laughs> so it recognises 10 trivial achievements in the realms of technology and science each year I knew he, he did actually continue in, in that uh, field of business he <laughs> Fuck it, this is crazy. He invented a pesticide to repel cockroaches and rats because they, back then, were bad for destroying the electronics within the karaoke machines. Mm-hmm. So that's where he started making money. Um, and he also went on to work in a company that procured the 8-track music for karaoke machines for quite some time. He uh, he was a band leader, he was a drummer, he was a keyboardist. He specialised in, in these sing-alongs at nightclubs and, and running them uh, in, I think it's Sanomiya. Uh, which is like the ent- entertainment sort of nightlife district of Kobe. But he had grown so popular. This is the, the the motivation behind doing this was he basically got so popular that he became overbooked and he realised that by recording instruments for clients when he could not go and personally perform, he could sort of be in more than one place, if you know what I mean. And mm. likewise with getting a drummer for something he was doing, it, it, it became actually quite a good solution. He realised the potential for that market. He also commissioned a coin-operated machine that, that gave you like a certain amount of minutes for singing time. Like uh, Nagishi's, it was based on an 8-track uh, deck. Uh, I knew he called it the 8 Duke. He loaned the machines to establishments for free, actually, in exchange for a portion of the monthly earnings from the machines. So basically he got a percentage of the coins that people put in. He placed the first eight jukes in Sanomia's snack bars, uh, but they initially failed to take off. He then, and this is something that is kind of echoed later on in a more ambitious way, he then hired singers or hostesses to, to sing in them, you know, really to really go for it, um, which kind of sparked off interest in them and got the night going, you know, thawed the, thawed the room out. It's like it's like a dance floor or, you know, karaoke is mm-hmm. like that. Who's the first person to get up and sing and make everybody a bit less self-conscious? So he would hire these women to go up and sing in them to get people interested. However, the eight jukes actually caused a lot of friction on the music scene because at that time there was a group of musicians called the Nagashi and they were basically professional guitarists that would tour about and play music for people to sing along with so they would learn all these standards and folks would just get up and sing and so I mean Inui's machine was really starting to put them out of business I mean first of all because they were solo and so it was more interesting to sing with a full ensemble but also just because it was just a bit more 
fun and adventurous and it opened up the potential of what you could actually sing along with as well because there's only so much you could do on, on a guitar and in the 1970s that trend really took off and spread all across Japan um, companies like JVC who I think certainly I knew when I was growing up for like audio and video and things like that they began creating their own devices and karaoke was performed mainly in bars and hostess clubs in front of other patrons. But in the 80s, a new style with private rooms emerged, which are called karaoke boxes. Um, in South Korea, they were called Norabangs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, mainland China and Taiwan, uh, those places are called a KTV. As you kind of hinted at earlier on, Asia is where karaoke is just so fucking huge. In fact, in some traditional Chinese restaurants uh, in China, there are what they call mahjong karaoke rooms where the elderly sit and play mahjong while the teenagers sing karaoke at the <laughs> same time, which is fucking rad. Yeah, it's I mean, um, so big. That it's, uh, I've, I've got a note here. It's uh, a $7.5 billion industry in Japan alone every year. That's a huge contribution to the the, the, the economy of, of already a quite a wealthy nation, you know, so it just goes to show how big it is. That's just one country. I can't imagine what it is worldwide. Multiple times that, you know. Yeah. So it's actually probably a good juncture to go over to Shuzhen because we're obviously talking about Asia and karaoke in Asia. Uh, as a, a Chinese musician, let's, let's see what she has to say about it. I went to karaoke way before I went to my first gig. Because karaoke in China is a, such a big thing, you can find it everywhere, every time, 24 hours. So I went there like uh, around 12, 13 years old, and there's no like age limitation. <laughs> you can just go, and I went there for the birthday party of my one of my friends. And in karaoke, it's also a very mixed place uh, in you you got like a bunch of people just playing dice and you got a bunch of people like drinking you got a bunch of people that are actually into singing and the facilitations of uh, a lot of karaoke in china are very professional you got um, sometimes if you're lucky you got like a wide range of catalog of foreign songs and it's easy you can just touch on the screen and search by characters or by pinging and you can find sounds and my go-to sounds are normally uh so kind of sounds because i want to practice my vocal a little bit it's it's kind of hard to sing at home and uh, i often select like uh, arisa franklin and uh, dusting springfield you know just uh, very soulful sounds uh, i i really enjoy yeah so uh Shujin's, uh mentioning that whole thing about people playing dice and people doing various different things in the karaoke bar this sounds like much more of a communal thing we've got a couple of those in Glasgow uh, the most infamous one's probably Cosmopol mm-hmm. yeah I mean that's one of the places you can just walk in and walk on stage and just go for it if you want to you know what I mean it's not it's not a private room it's just a you know you are what you are I guess when you do that <laughs> I think one of the things about Cosmopol that I both love and hate is that the stage that you're on has its back to the main road. It's a pretty busy street as well, and it's a glass front. So like whoever's singing has their backsides sort of pointing out the window as people stand in horror, like reeling with laughter or whatever at the window behind them as they're singing to the room. And oh, the number of times as well you go by there and it's like a ghost town. There's maybe only like seven people in it and there's somebody up there Give it, you know, big high o silver lining to almost mm. nobody. Uh, you know, barflies. Um, karaoke has that potential to be weirdly tragic and bleak. I think it's actually been used that way quite well in some films. I think in Britain and just- British films and American films, it's often used that way. I don't really think you get that much in Eastern in, in Asian cinema, far east, far eastern cinema. No, I mean you get it in um, was it Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray? Um, Lost in translation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Harris. Thanks. This is hard. I could feel at the time there was no 
lost in translation. I think there's a an element of melancholy to mm-hmm. the way it's used in, in, in that film. But uh, it's got a wee bit of that sometimes as well because it's so associated with like reverie and then sometimes it's just <laughs> like really fucking grim. Mm. Um, you know, there's actually a Japanese word specifically for singing karaoke by yourself in a private room. Uh, <laughs> Hitokara, mm-hmm. H-I-T-O-K-A-R-A. Um, that's basically renting a private room and just singing karaoke to yourself, whether it be fun. for practice or just out of sheer fucking despondency. I don't know. Um, it's interesting that um, Shu Ying there, she talks about choosing Aretha Franklin and Dusty Springfield to practice her vocals. And it's quite pertinent that, obviously, being someone that comes from China as well, because karaoke is quite, it's quite an engaging platform for people to learn other languages and the intonation of certain words and just develop their skills generally, you know. And I suppose, if you if you think about it from an Eastern perspective as well, it's, they are getting exposure to a cultural sort of milieu that they would never, ever get otherwise unless they left the country, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it becomes quite, I think, culturally and linguistically, it, it can be quite important for many different cultures all over the world, not just the East, but any, like, I imagine it's the same in Mexico or the same in Portugal or whatever, you know, like, it gives people familiarity with the English, English language and saying and certain words and the, the intonation and the way that they're actually spoken in, in real life. Because as someone that's learning Danish, I've never actually had a conversation with anybody in Danish. I know how to read it all right, but it's that lack of immersion, you know what I mean? And if, you, if you're if you learning another language in a country which doesn't really speak English, the lack of immersion can be quite detrimental. So having a tool like karaoke... I can see how that'd be quite beneficial for picking up on our language, you know, practically. If that yeah, makes sense. But, you know, to that end, uh, Iceland deliberately wrote the world's hardest yeah. karaoke song. Saw that, yeah. It went viral. Before you go and play, you might see a dwarf bear or haiku. Can't say that. Because that's my dad. Puppy. Puppy. I said that right, I think. It was so difficult, it was all about the vowels apparently, they were so difficult and Icelandic schools ended up using it to teach their language. Yeah, it's one of the hardest um, languages in the world to learn, Iceland, Icelandic. Yeah, so. uh, there were apparently nearly one billion interactions with that uh, original post mm-hmm. of that track, but yeah, so they embraced that. Uh, other nations as well outside of Asia that have really embraced it is <laughs> Finland, the biggest audience uh, per capita outside of Asia. Well, the biggest ever party happened in Tennessee. That's right. Yeah. Aye, another karaoke fact. What was that called? Uh, it was in Bristol, Tennessee. It was just the largest ever karaoke. Uh, 160,000 people sang like along with Friends, friends, low friends, yeah. friends, that's it, friends in Low Places by Garth Brooks. That song actually charts pretty high on some of the lists, and I wonder how much that one event <laughs> <laughs> played. Yeah, can, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, <laughs> quite bumping a lot. it up. Yeah, uh, there's you know uh, the fourth week of April every year is National Karaoke That's Week right, in, the, yeah. in the USA as kind well. Of like, it makes sense that Americans would love it, but yeah, I don't. I, I don't think I've never seen a karaoke place in America. Even I've only been there a couple of times, but I'm sure there are loads. Just never seen them. <laughs> I think it's a big thing in bars. Yeah. I think they've got a bit of the like the open bar approach to it. Now we mentioned earlier on about things changing with technology. Uh, in the nineteen eighties, video karaoke became a thing. Laserdisc led to the company Pioneer offering video images with lyrics superimposed over them. 
And actually, in the 1990s, what could probably be called the first audio streaming service arrived via karaoke. This actually, we didn't actually mention this when we were doing any of the shows about streaming services, but um, Yuichi Yasutomo created a networked system of karaoke machines where MIDI signals were broadcast down phone lines, allowing the machines to then access these huge databases of, of music rather than mm. just either the cassettes, you know, the 8-track cassettes or what was actually plugged into them at the time. Mm. Um, MIDI is a strange concept for people who don't work in certainly electronic music or even audio production and things like that I guess an easy way to explain MIDI it's like a very simple almost like a binary pattern that triggers notes and it can therefore be simplified right down to like values and those values then are worth different musical tones and pitches and the length and the the various uh, modulation of the of the sound but rather than actually sending audio you're not sending an actual sound of say a piano or a violin or a guitar down a phone line you're sending this sort of data and then when it gets to the other end it uses that to generate the sound there um, mm-hmm. and it's a really it's a, it's a language that's used i mean you'll see it people connect up synthesizers to, which all speak to each other in midi and so therefore they can replicate the same sound and you can get all kinds of things going on with it likewise you can write music in midi and then you, you can, can yeah mm-hmm. yeah and then you can basically hear what it sounds like oh let's hear that pattern on a piano okay let's change it let's hear what it sounds on a guitar let's change it let's hear what it sounds on a glockenspiel and you Mm. can do it it's very very easy and so midi is a really really easy thing to send about the files are not even very big either because the data is really really simplified so it was possible to actually send this down phone lines relatively uncorrupted which meant if you were in a karaoke booth, you could basically not literally phone up, pick up a receiver, but you could say, right, I want this song. The machine would contact the database and it would send that song back down to your machine, which just massively expanded it. The best analogy I can think of actually is when jukeboxes went digital. Originally, you know, in jukeboxes, it was like either the records or the CDs that were loaded into that jukebox. They were Mm -hmm. what you could play. Then suddenly there were these digital jukeboxes, which were basically kind of like a version of Spotify. They just had this massive bank of music and you could go up to the jukebox and start hunting about hundreds of thousands of titles rather than just what was there in the hundred CDs. Mm -hmm. Um, In 1992, the company Taito released the X2000, which is a very modern sounding name Mm -hmm. for anything to use networked music libraries and by 1998 that entire networked approach accounted for 94% for, of all of Japan's uh, karaoke systems and karaoke rooms so the model of like the little machine with the discs or the cartridges and things like that, that really died out that's probably actually quite kitsch now probably if you have one it's probably worth quite a lot of money and actually, uh, apparently the, the typical American home theatre system, this is like if you've ever watched Married with Children or Home Improvement, so that it was always this thing that the dad was getting. It was like a home theatre system, mm-hmm. you know, the big thing you could sit and watch the game in front of. And home theatre systems apparently began life as karaoke systems. But since the karaoke systems at home didn't actually prove that popular in North America, the systems evolved to be more multi-purpose and pairing them with like home cinema setups and things like that, making a lot of them still had a karaoke feature but it was totally marginalised on on the machine itself and actually a lot of stereos were like that for a while I remember having a stereo that had karaoke on it as well which yeah my mum had one yeah it was never used but that was it as we mentioned with MIDI the technology started to make the karaoke just a little bit more flexible as well so uh, pitch changes are pretty easy once MIDI's brought into play because you can just move the MIDI down or up as many steps as you want so you, a lot of songs are deceptively fucking high uh, when you actually go and try and belt them out and so it could help you bring it down into your range uh, they did actually do that on some of the older karaoke machines for a while um, but they did it by just slowing down the cassettes mm-hmm. <laughs> It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it does, absolutely. Have you ever had the batteries <laughs> running out in a Walkman? You know what that sounds like, but that was how they slowed it down back then. Um, you also had a thing called karaoke roulette, or it's also known as kamikaze karaoke, uh, which is a more gamified version of it, where you basically randomly choose a number in the system. So when they became digitised, uh, I think Shujin mentioned it there, like rather than having a big book of titles, you could just kind of go into a bank on the machine and just sort of, you would type in the digits that you want. So it, there's a gamified version of it where you do that 
and you have to sing what Whatever comes, comes up. out, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> then the brilliant. room, exactly, and the room judge, it judges you on your efforts, and then <laughs> I'm sure, sure there's all kinds of drinking games possible as a, re- a result of that, but that's yeah. karaoke roulette, kamikaze karaoke. No, it's not called also, kamikaze karaoke in Japan, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit I've, on the nose for them. Uh, yeah, I have no idea how culturally insensitive <laughs> that is, but it's written here, so it must be true. <laughs> I, I, it probably is true. I just wonder if it's maybe used in like South Korea or no, or, I'd imagine or the that's, Philippines. Like. That's probably the American version. <laughs> <laughs> um, some other little uh, tricks that they used in these machines. So um, some the karaoke systems tried to create karaoke versions of music using a thing called the out-of-phase stereo effect or the oops effect, O-O-P-S effect, where when you get a, a stereo music signal, they would subtract the left audio from the right audio. Um, I know that sounds a bit abstract, but they would subtract the left from the right. And what that would do was basically remove anything that was centre panned and vocals on vocals. Re- yeah vocals on records are usually down the middle of a and record and bass though <laughs> and bass <laughs> yeah yeah that's true um, and then they would try and do that to clear out the room of the for the vocal in the middle of the song and there were systems that did that I mean have you ever had a Sega Saturn fucking Sega Saturn that had a mute vocals button on it that that's is pretty ex- cool I didn't know that I never had one ex- of them nobody had yeah. one of them in, in, in the west that's a problem <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, that, is, that was a big reason that <laughs> white beauty died out um, but uh, the mute vocals button that's what that did it used the oops effect on it um, it, it can create some pretty fucking wacky versions of music I had an old cassette adapter, right? So back when I had an iPod, you used to get those kind of like st- little mini jack to cassette things that you put in your cassette player to convert it, right? And as the wires got frayed, if they were occasionally touching, you could somehow accidentally create this this oops effect. It was also to do with where the wee sensor was in your cassette player. And I had one that just did it all the time. And I remember just putting records on to hear this bizarre version of the records. Because what you were left to was just odd remnants. I remember the Caven album, Jupiter, listening to it in its entirety on this. It was so surreal. Because, for example, you wouldn't hear the vocal, but you could hear the reverb from the vocal. You know? <laughs> and you would hear anything if it suddenly got did you know panned in the mix as a as a wee technique? It would suddenly start appearing and disappearing, and it was mm-hmm. just very very strange. So, uh, it's a what would you call it? It's a bit of a hack. Yeah, right? it's not it's, foolproof at all. <laughs> it's definitely not, man. If you were paying good money to go and use that, you'd be a little bit pissed off, I think. Um, but yeah, talking about technology as well, Sega Saturns um, paving the way for what has eventually become Guitar Hero. And mm-hmm. Sing Star and all these kind of like the games that we have now. Um, in 1985, the Super Famicom. Now, Mark, you're far too fucking young to know what a Super it's Famicom, Famicom right? is. It was a NES. It was a NES here. No, it, well, it was a SNES. Like the pre- cur- it was a precursor to that, right? And I remember when I was oh, first. Oh yeah, because in- NES was a Famicom, and so that makes sense. Super NES, yeah. That makes when, sense. when I was really in Nintendo, really into it, like subscribing to the magazines, all that stuff, right? The Super Famicom was this hallowed thing in Japan. I had a SNES when I was younger. Yeah, I mean, well, I had a SNES as well. But what I mean is, well before that, I mean, eighty-five, mm. right? There was this thing that you kept reading about and you saw these pictures of it. You're like, That's, that basically looks real. It's like the size of these characters. These characters are at least half the size of the screen. How can a computer do that without crashing, you know? Because any time you played any game that had a kit like Double Dragon and four people came onto the fucking screen and the whole thing just started flickering, right? Because it couldn't deal with it. Meanwhile, you're seeing these pictures from Japan of this Super Famicom. I mean, that was that was the dream back in the day, right? But the Super Famicom was the first to have karaoke studio. The low memory on the system, however, like I think it was cartridges uh, yeah, as well back then, yeah, meant it was not a lot of songs could be held in it. But that is effectively the, the, the game precursor to what we now take for granted as 
mm. things like Sing Star and Guitar Hero. Um, also, in 2003, Karaoke Revolution came out on PlayStation 2, and that actually scored your performance, again, setting the scene for Sing Star and Guitar Hero. And that was the first one to really put in motion this uh, scoring of the performance, mm-hmm. you know, tracking your, your thing, and that was the game part of it. I remember a friend of mine had the ABBA one. I think their mum really liked ABBA uh, on the PS2, the Sing Star ABBA. And I was like, what the fuck is that? I, 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 was, I, I, I knew that, that back then when I was that young, my mum liked ABBA, but I did not like ABBA, obviously, because it was too, I was too cool. I was only like 16, um, 17, I guess, but yeah. A lot of growing up to do. Yeah, what I, what I did, and I grew up, and I, wish, I actually wish I had that, to be honest, now. <laughs> right, well, before we go on to any other part of the, the lore here, let's uh, go to another uh, contributor. Uh, this time, let's hear from Vicky, uh, okay. who had... Remarkably large amount of things to say Even though she didn't seem to think so <laughs> Hello it's Vicky here To talk to you about karaoke I wouldn't say I'm wild about karaoke Generally something That I'm a little fearful of Until some kind of Lubricant has been applied And then I take to it with great gusto Whether anyone Wants me to or not I really enjoy singing I sing all the time at home, but unfortunately I'm not that talented a singer. So to make up for that when I do karaoke, I tend to pick something where I can manipulate my voice in some way. So my go-to song on karaoke is Ellie Woman by The Doors. Jim Morrison has a much deeper voice than me, um, so I have to bring it right down. Um, I get karaoke and why it's fun. I think it's more fun when you're with your friends and it's in some kind of more intimate, private scenario, like a karaoke booth or a party. The whole doing it in a pub in front of people, that's less enjoyable for me and less enjoyable for me to hear as well. In fact, Last week I went to the Christmas market. Me and my boyfriend went down hoping to have a nice romantic Christmas evening and there was some woman singing karaoke. Well, it sounded like karaoke. And it's not enjoyable listening to strangers singing karaoke. It's enjoyable listening to your pals singing karaoke, getting into it and seeing them in a different light. Because when people go up and sing, it's funny because you see a different side to them, don't you? And people you don't even expect go up when they sing karaoke, it's it's nice. It's a bonding experience. So yeah, um, not really got much to say about karaoke. See you later. Hi. So uh, I mean, I guess by humbug for Vicky then for the <laughs> Christmas well, karaoke. <laughs> lot, yeah, the Christmas karaoke. Yeah, I mean, I, see, I can sympathise with that because. Like, like I said earlier on, you just need to walk down past Central Station, past the Toby Jog in Glasgow City Centre to hear oh. that any given night, you know what I mean? That's, that's before you get to Cosmopol. That's <laughs> a good reference, by the way. And the thing is, people get into Glasgow at Central Station quite often, and for a lot of them, that'll be what they accidentally hear first. Yeah. Or if they go to the right, they'll walk past the Horseshoe Bar, which has usually got a much better quality of karaoke singer, significantly. Right. So, the other day, I was out with my friends, I'm walking down uh, Drury Lane, uh, mm-hmm. Drury Lane that's where Drury it? Street is yeah, no, Drury Street are. yeah mm-hmm. and uh, there's karaoke going on up at, upstairs at the horseshoe you can see the lights flashing on the roof right but loud as you like all the way so down loud, the street man. you can hear somebody singing I think it's exit music from a film by radio <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> right. wake from your sleep the drive um, if you've ever seen Father Ted Do you remember the <laughs> suicidal priest That gets cheered up yeah. And then he gets back on the bus And then the bus driver starts playing that song mm-hmm. And slowly you can see the colour draining from his face again right? Somebody had gone in to like a Friday night karaoke <laughs> And requested <laughs> Probably the most depressing Radiohead song I can think of uh-huh. And they were giving it big licks Especially in the high note And they were not even close to getting that high note <laughs> <laughs> It was 
properly like brutal, brutal listening. And I couldn't help but try and imagine the scene in that room because either the room was empty and there was somebody standing there with balloons and flashing lights on their own singing this or there were a number of horrified looking patrons. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, like I said, it's usually a higher quality of, of singer there. And other places, the Grant Arms as well, they do it there too. Uh, just all around Central Station. So if you're new to the city and you're walking anywhere within like 50 feet of Central Station, you'll come across somebody <laughs> singing something terribly. You've, you've kind of, you've stumbled across something here. It does seem to be a bit of a hotbed of karaoke activity. Yeah, it? totally bizarre, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but I'm going, to, I'm going to do something a bit unusual here, but I think it might be a good place to do this. So we've just relayed, and Vicky's just relayed some of our, our uh, karaoke horror stories. So if you have any, just send us a message or get at us on social media. I'd love, we'd love to hear them because uh, I'm sure you've got some funnier ones than those. Hopefully you've got some funnier ones than some of the anecdotes that we've got. But um, yeah, anyway, back on track, I suppose. Well, I promised this earlier on, courtesy of Neil, the printer man. Um, he used to work with the Bay City Rollers. <laughs> Uh, Neil, Neil's worked with a, a bunch of recording artists and stuff um, and uh, apparently the Bay City Rollers were really, really big in Japan. Um, in fact, I think one of them, uh, Les McEwen, was married to a Japanese woman mm. and Les used to go over to Japan and, and apparently what they used to do was that uh, Les would be paid to go and be in karaoke rooms and then <laughs> the karaoke bar proprietor would charge customers like a fortune and I assume split the proceeds with Les for the opportunity for them to go into the karaoke room and sing Bay City Roller songs with a member of the Bay City Rollers for a little bit of extra cash. Oh, and this wait. became like a very profitable sideline when he was over there. Yeah, it's pretty funny. What was their big song? Saturday Night. Saturday Night, yeah. Can you imagine how sick he would be of that there's, song? There's quite a few. There's <laughs> Quite a few other things that be said yeah. that we could go into as well that will not bother me. But um, yeah, so there you go. Back to you know people we know talking about karaoke that are not basically rollers. Ellie Women by the Doors, uh, Vicky. Um, did she Great sing that at your lyric. birthday? Yeah, she did. It's the one that goes. <laughs> Is that, it's that, that, that Doors die? That Doors song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for karaoke. But I, it's a bold choice for a woman to sing because his voice, like she said, his voice is quite low. <laughs> just, just sound drunk, that's it. She, and as she said, she needs to be, so it's probably quite appropriate. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about another uh, cultural footprint here, uh, karaoke and television. So we spoke about, uh, you know, Super Famicom and the PlayStation 2 and stuff paving the way for what's now Guitar Hero, which is a huge industry. Uh, karaoke and television talent shows, basically, are either all or in part predominantly karaoke competitions even the likes of the kind of more general ones America's Got Talent and stuff still rely really heavily on that singing format and it's that is a huge TV format uh, and, and industry globally you've got X Factor America's Got Talent, Britain's Got Talent the pop, uh, pop Stars, sorry The that was Voice, mm-hmm. uh, Got What It Takes is one, Rising Star there's one called Mamma Mia which is kind of related, there's one called Starstruck uh, which we'll come back to in a second and then Going way back as well, I mean, there was a load of this. We spoke about that sing along with Mitch earlier on, but you've got the Gong Show in the USA in the 70s. Mm. I think it was the late 70s. Chuck Barris hosted that really famous show where if they were terrible, they would just hit the gong and the person would have to mm-hmm. piss off. But here in the UK, I think the idea of karaoke TV started for a lot of people, certainly people of our age, with stars in their eyes. Stars in your eyes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it was a full karaoke and costume performance show. You know, mm. tonight, Matthew, I am going to be, then the doors would open and they would come out not only doing a song by, but dressed as dressed somebody. Like yeah. yeah. The, the um, guy that won it is Freddie Mercury. He, I think he managed to make an entire career out of being a, I was going to say in person, a tribute act to, tribute to act. Queen, which is pretty cool. Tell us who you're going to be tonight, Gary. Well, tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury! A rock legend reborn as tonight. Singing live, Gary Bowen is Freddie Mercury! 
So that show ran from 1990 to 2006. It was on ITV and produced by a company called Granada, which I'm sure a lot of you also remember their, their logo. It was originally hosted by a guy called Leslie Crowther and then later it was hosted by a much maligned uh, host called Matthew Kelly, a guy who faced some really horrible allegations that turned out to be false but they really nearly ruined the guy's life he was actually temporarily replaced by Davina McCall, really familiar TV personality over here during that period and then he came back and then shortly after he left permanently, replaced by someone called Kat Dealey and then she was replaced by Harry Hill and people did not like the take that the comedian Harry Hill had on that show Um, that show was actually originally meant to be hosted by Chris Tarrant, Um, he made the unaired pilots for 1989 but they swapped him for Leslie Crowther Oh, interesting I think Leslie Crowther died about 1994 or something like that Mm. And the all-time most imitated acts on Stars in Their Eyes Were Dolly Parton, Elvis and Cher Um, The show actually rebranded as Starstruck I mentioned that a second ago in 2022 And is hosted by Ollie Moores Ollie, Ollie Moores, yeah Which I believe translates as Ollie Walls (laughs) <laughs> this is funnier um, Stars in Their Eyes itself originally stemmed from a show in the Netherlands called Sound Mix Show and by the way that's all one word Sound Mix Show <laughs> what a brilliant name um, that was created by a guy called Jupe van der Ende and hosted by Henry Huisman uh, he was like an ex-rock drummer and played in a couple of touring bands and that was itself a variation on an earlier Dutch show called The Playback Show Um, and that was the first to feature a celebrity judging panel Uh, it was three people at a time and they even tried phone voting in that show once but it crashed the entire Dutch phone grid (laughs) (laughs) so they had to abandon it you fucked it lads you've totally fucked it lads (laughs) um, so playback show was rebooted years and years later as mini playback show which was basically the same thing but for children Mm -hmm. and it was hosted by a woman called Marika Amado who was also the woman that hosted the WWF club as in WWE uh, the magazine show for wrestling wow. in the in the eighties in the Netherlands. So that's, that's who you cool. saw in the karaoke show. But yeah, there are other uh, there are non competitive and sort of celebrity approaches to karaoke TV over here as well. The obvious one being carpool karaoke. I think um, in the early nineteen nineties. Uh, South Korea started the first karaoke taxi services and that sort of set this whole thing in motion Um, in 1992 both the LA Times and Seattle Times ran articles about South Korean taxi services karaoke Mm -hmm. taxi services there were apparently a hundred of them or thereabouts doing the rounds in Seoul the drivers used it to generate a bit more income especially on longer journeys Um, but the local authorities frowned on it because they felt it distracted the drivers funnily enough at that time by the way Japanese music was banned in South Korea due to the British of Japanese colonial rule up until mm-hmm. 1945. Wow. The Big Breakfast over here in the UK did a bit about the UK's first karaoke cab, um, all one word, in 2004. That was like a black hack, like a black hackney, a big typical London cab if you've never seen one. But now there are there's loads of rowdy karaoke taxis going around the cities. Uh, you know, you get the really big limo ones, you get karaoke buses going buses, about. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hen parties hanging out every window, <laughs> shouting at you, like, fucking, honestly, like, men cowering in fear, getting a taste of their own medicine when those fucking vehicles go by. <laughs> Never felt so objectified and threatened in my life. Um, uh, the Chinese company, Geely Automobile, released a car in 2003 called the Beauty Leopard, there's a fucking name for a car, by the way. And that had a karaoke feature in it. And apparently Teslas now include a car a okay app. That's, that's true, yeah. It's wild. They've actually got a massive sound system in Tesla, so it's got an option on it where you can it can perform a show for you and it basically just like flashes all the lights and opens and closes the doors and blasts music out and all that, like really fucking loud. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, he sounds like a lot of fun, Elon Musk, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Um, another interesting fact here. Now, I mean, I think we associate carpool karaoke with that annoying bastard James Corden. Mm-hmm. Who, by the way, didn't... You know, in the, in the show, he's like shown driving. Yeah. The, fairly often he wasn't actually driving. He was just getting towed, but pretending mm-hmm. to drive, which I think just adds to the, the layer of annoying shit around yeah. that guy. Um, they spun but, that out, didn't they? They spun it out into his own show. Yeah, him? exactly. It went from being a feature into being a thing. But I think Jerry Seinfeld had been doing a thing like that for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And Jerry Seinfeld felt that James Corden had 
totally ripped him off and the two had a kind of war of words over it. But funnily enough, in 2009, there was a web series called Carpool that was hosted by Robert Llewellyn, who is also known as Crichton, Crichton. Red Dwarf. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And he started that and he accuses both Cherry Seinfeld <laughs> and James Corden of ripping him off. Um, some other ones, uh, some other shows that are kind of non-competitive. Or, well, they're competitive, but there's no real prize because it's celebrities. Uh, Celebrity Karaoke Club, which is an ITV from 2020 onwards. It's celebrities, and I say that as a qualified inverted commas term yeah. here because it's people from Love Island and Gogglebox. And they compete in various karaoke challenges. People who've um, been on telly. <laughs> yeah, famous for being sort of famous. Um, a couple of more notorious recent examples. The Masked Singer, the Masked which Singer I'm, yeah. I'm sure we've all heard of. Started in 2019 on Fox. Mm-hmm. Um, but it actually comes as part of a franchise that's built on a South yeah. Korean show called The King of Mask Singer. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that kind of made headlines when Rudy Giuliani appeared out of one of the characters, uh, which prompted the, uh, the actor and writer Ken Long to walk off. Um, yeah. Although it's worth noting that <laughs> Ken Long's on a judging panel with Robin Thicke and Jenny McCarthy Wahlberg (laughs) who's like (laughs) a fucking pop culture bin diver anyway (laughs) uh, anti-vaxxer another show uh, which I'd never heard of until I started doing this research but Killer Karaoke have you heard of this? No, no hosted by Steve O and Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister wow yeah It's, it's on the, in the USA Contestants try to do karaoke As, as the audience and the, the hosts of the team Try to distract them There's a whole list of rounds in this by the way And fucking Some of them are NSFW But the rounds include One called Big Stank Where the contestants Brackets usually female Sing while being sandwiched By two sweaty 500 pound strippers <laughs> <laughs> uh, A round called Hair Razor The contestants, usually male, sit back in a barber's chair and have various body hair removed by a strip wax treatment. And the whole point is that they have to sing uninterrupted or Mm. they lose the... It's like 90 seconds, I think. Um, There's a round called Swamp Swing, brackets Troubled Waters, where the contestants sit on a swing and get dipped into ice-cold water with snakes. (laughs) I don't don't get that. In saying that though I don't think snakes Would be very busy In ice cold water No right? I think but Maybe they'd be trying to escape And that's kind of the problem Because they might They might bite you and yeah, they're Floating not. about um, yeah. And there's uh, The last one I'll mention A round called Bite Club Or Leader of the Pack Where the contestants Get attacked and bitten By a series of guard dogs While <laughs> wearing A heavily padded suit <laughs> My God! It sounds like a Paul Verhoeven film, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's ended. It's end of days type shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Steve, old man. What's he? What's he all about? Fucking. There was so many other things on that list as well that I could have included. I just we would just it would have gone on forever. And talking about going on forever, uh, there's still quite a lot to get through <laughs> here. So I have a feeling we should probably stick a wee break in here. Yeah. Uh, so what? So this is coming out when? This episode is, will be out on the 18th, so or for the oh my. listening public. The night, the night before the recording. The night before, the, yeah, the night before, potentially. <laughs> yeah, potentially. potentially. Yeah. Wow, okay, so we're going to go in to part two of karaoke. Hopefully a nice wee treat for you on Christmas Day if your family are doing your head in. Yeah, hopefully, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, and that will give me enough time to shake off the hangover and edit the Christmas episode, <laughs> which has been a problem in the past, by the way. Staring at that fucking screen for like hours and hours and hours, with a head absolutely banging. So that's a good. week to do it, so you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll bring it to a temporary close there and we'll come back with more karaoke. Karaoke. Uh, next week. Karaoke. Okay. I don't think we're pronouncing it by again. Kari. Okay, I think it's karaoke. Karaoke. Yeah. Karaoke. Karaoke. We yeah. all say karaoke, don't we? I mean, we've absolutely murdered the Japanese pronunciation in this anyway. Yep. So, what are you going to do? Yeah. We will come back to this next week. Yeah, bye.